I was involved in preaching at a wedding yesterday out at Worsley and, and then back to be with my family a few minutes and then back for the supper. And I grabbed my notebook this morning and thought, yeah, we're all ready to go. Got here and opened it and I have no notes. So they're out the farm. It's only 45 minutes out there. So I went to Faith and said, Faith, what? No, I went to Gracie first. So she lent me hers. Faith ran me another copy and I got here. Somebody's gracious enough to have a copy laying here. Who did that for me? Wow. You know, Faith, there's a good chance you're going to get on stage. Good job, girl. It is great to be back with you, and boy, has it been hot. Uh, this last week, I got a text from some friends at Cochrane, and she was talking about how hot it was. And I said, yeah, we had one day this week, it got up to 23 up here. And then I didn't put anything else, and I left it, and she came back to me. Oh, wow, that's pretty good. I said, plus about 13. She said, oh, okay, now. <laughs> so, yeah, it has been hot. I am grateful today that uh, Kurt asked me to take his place. I'm always honored to get to preach in your hearing and uh, praying for uh, Pastor Paul and for Shelley, uh, wherever they are right now. Uh, one other announcement I would share with you uh, this evening began SYC for our summer youth celebration. Uh, there are some 350-something already registered for there. Uh, about 25, 23 or 25 kids from Worsley. Uh, they're going on a bus this afternoon, so uh, be with Chris as he drives that load of kids and uh, two or three sponsors going with them. Cesar Pera, if you've ever heard Cesar preach, he is uh, energy plus. Uh, evangelism is his thing. He loves God, loves people. When he was lost, uh, a, couple of, a couple of women came to his door in Toronto and told him about Jesus Christ and told him that your sins could be forgiven. He said, you don't know who I am. They said, yeah, we do, and he can forgive your sins. Well, needless to say, Caesar became a Christian, and one of the ladies at the door became his wife later. And so Caesar and Mary are a dynamic couple. Uh, he was known in the Toronto area because of his lifestyle and his fighting ability. Uh, he was born in Chile and his wife in Venezuela. And he had uh, gotten in a fight, just to share a little bit about who's talking to the youth this week. He'd gotten in a fight and missed the guy's head and put his arm through a glass window. And they went in and, and the doctors were saying, we're gonna have to amputate. He said, no, please don't, I'm an artist. And he is. And uh, so they saved his arm and uh, you don't want to get within three miles of Caesar or he's going to tell you about Jesus. He loves the God who saved him because he knows what he saved him from and what he saved him to. So uh, let's pray again and, and include, and thank you, Josh. You prayed, right? Thank you for praying for all these youth camps and children's activities. So many lives, if they don't come to know the Lord Jesus, there's some seeds that are planted, some watering that's done that their destinations are, t are changed that very weekend. And so, Cook, I don't know your name, but I know you're Cook. So uh, we'll be praying for you. What a task, what a responsibility. Hot days, and then you put in a hot kitchen and start cooking, and uh, your prayer request is right. That there'll be harmony, there'll be fellowship uh, in the kitchen as well as in the camps. So let's pray together. Our Father and our God, what a, a blessing it is today to be called Christian because of what you've done in our lives. You brought us from a destination that was headed to destruction, and you've written our name in the Lamb's Book of Life. And Father, if there will be one in this room today that does not yet know you as Savior and Lord, may this be the day that their name would be illumined also in the Lamb's Book of Life. Lord, for those of us who are Christians, some have been a Christian for a long time, Lord, we would believe that right now, Canada, America, and the world is in desperate need of a fresh touch, a fresh word from you, Lord Jesus. So we pray for all these kids, all these camps, our political leaders, our civic leaders, even in this town and other areas, 
Lord, be with all the men and women that are in this room today. They have their own burdens. They have their own load to carry. And God, we want to be a people who has a heart uh, that you can really use uh, to bring honor and glory and praise to your name. So I pray today that you will speak to us afresh. Please be with Pastor Paul and Shelly where they are. Give them a great day, a great enjoy, a day to enjoy you and to enjoy one another. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have your Bibles, I invite you to follow along with me. Again, I will use a, a few different scriptures. My message today is entitled, The Heart That Our God Can Best Use. And as I uh, closely observe what's going on in our world and in our society and how the church is being impacted, uh, today I would say to you, my heart wants to speak to your heart. I want us to get it more than just an academic brain to brain. I want our hearts to feel what God has to say to us. And uh, we have a significant age span in here, I've already observed. Uh, but I do pray that the Lord will speak to each of us at the level in which we are and the level in which we can understand. Our first point is the great invitations in Psalm 26, verse 2 and 3. He says, Test me, O Lord, and try me. Examine my heart and my mind. For I've always been mindful of your unfailing love, Lord, and have lived in reliance on your faithfulness, Lord. The first part where he says, Test me. Uh, I know most of us would say, we have more testings and more trials than we really want. But this is when you intentionally, consciously, willingly, deliberately sit down and say, Lord God, I want you to test me. Now that's not an arrogant statement. That's a statement say, Lord, I need you to help me know exactly where I'm at. Now it may be more revealing than we want, but when you ask God to test you, be ready to feel the impact of it. Because when it says, test me, that's a procedure that's intended to establish the quality. You know, a lot of us uh, have known people that their religion, their Christianity, is what we would say a mile wide and a half an inch deep. And this is where when we're saying, Lord, I want you to test me, and I want you to establish the quality, the performance, or the reliability of something. They tell us that when computers are built and tested, they receive all kinds of abuse to make sure they are ready to go out. But this also says that this is done especially before it is taken into widespread use. Now what that means is when God is testing your mind or he's testing you, that is just between you and him. Oftentimes, I think people are going through testings and nobody else around knows that's happening because they're able to handle it. You know, I, I love, we're talking about kids. Uh, adults learn how to kind of hedge stuff, don't we? You know, how are you doing? Oh, I'm doing fine. When really every wheel is loose. Some are about to fall off. I like this morning, or I think it was maybe last night, uh, maybe it was this morning, a little great-granddaughter who's coming forward. We we're trying to get her to finish her breakfast. And she says, when a child is full, a child is full. Well, that's being pretty honest, saying I don't want any more. Uh, I, I think what we're dealing with right here, when God's doing his testing, is when no one else knows what's going on. Now, sometimes my response, we say, well, that, caused, that, that was stress for me. Stuff doesn't cause you stress. How you respond to it is where the stress comes from. So he's saying, test me before I go into widespread use. Uh, that would mean just between you and God, between God and me. And then he says, try me. I, I, don't, I don't know if I encourage and recommend that to you, but I think it's healthy and wholesome to say to God, try me. Make some severe demands on me. I want to see how well I do. God, just go ahead and really test me. 
and see how I do when I'm really under pressure. You know, I think a high percent of the time we think we're under pressure and we can't take any more. Have you ever been in that and then all of a sudden it seemed like, boy, we dropped it down about four more notches. And God seems to be really putting us through the test and through trying us. I remember several years ago I was in Edmonton pastoring and a man from this area brought a, a big truck down and it was having some problems uh, when he drove it and I rode with him to the coming shop. Everything sounded fine. But he, bro he drove it there and they opened a the big door. He rolled it back in there and they chained it down on some big rollers. And uh, then when they chained it down, they put a, a thing on the exhaust pipe and put it out, told him to get up in there. So I'm watching on the floor. So he gets in there and he starts this big truck. You know, he goes through the gears and he goes through and he gets it up to a, you know, a pretty good speed. And it sounds perfect. But there's a man standing over here beside the truck and he had a, uh, a, a, a button on a dial and this dyno machine, when he started turning the button, you could hear the truck begin to start to labor. So the machine was monitoring, he turned it a little bit more. And he turned it a little bit more until all of a sudden, that truck started to give him signals of malfunctioning. I think, oftentimes, when we think we're in really good shape for the Lord, I think what the psalmist is saying here is, Turn the dial down a little more. Put the brakes on that roller while I've got the wheels going and see how far I can go before I begin to malfunction. My spirit goes sour. My attitude goes mean. My words go off to the side and I begin to question my faith and then I ultimately end up questioning God. And that's when we know there's a problem. This is what we're asking for here. God, uh, test me and try me so that I can know how well I do under pressure. Let me say to you today in Canada, if you are an absolute New Testament Christian where Jesus Christ is prevalent in your life, vocabulary, you could rest assured that the brakes are going to be put on you when you begin to talk about that and you begin to mention that. You're going to be challenged and challenged big time. But until you get in that arena, you will never know really how strong you are. And I think the best time to find out is when things are going good, right? Rather than it just starts happening, I haven't invited, I haven't asked God to. So join me in sometimes being courageous and just saying, God, I ask you to test me, I ask you to try me. And then he says, examine my heart meaning to expect someone or something in detail to determine their nature or condition to investigate thoroughly. You've invited God. Now, we would say, well, God already knows that about me, right? He knows everything about me. He knows what's in my heart. He knows what I'm saying. He knows what I'm thinking. But what about me inviting him and to say to him, God, I'm asking you right now to inspect my heart. See, that's the part that nobody else in here knows what's going on except you and God. What's in your heart? Do you have some bitterness towards someone? Do you have some disrespect for someone? Do you feel like the church maybe hadn't treated me right? They've overworked me with little recognition. Uh, just, God, I'm asking you. I'm asking you to examine my heart and see what you find, see what you see, because I want it to be more like you. That's the ultimate goal of asking God to examine your heart, is not just to point out the problem, but to point out the problems in such a way that you will ask Him then to strengthen you, to encourage you, and to deliver you in that area. And then He says, examine my mind. Uh, I've always said, you know, you could be standing here preaching, I don't know what's in here, 100 people. I really have no idea how many of you are listening to me and paying attention to what I'm saying and trying to evaluate it. You may be off somewhere 10,000 kilometers from here. You may be thinking about last week's problems or next week's issues you have to deal with. But this is what he said. God, separate my mind out. Separate everything else. And you and you alone, I'm inviting you to examine 
my mind. Verse 3 says, For I've always been mindful of your unfailing love, Lord, and, and I've lived in reliance that I put in the Lord because that's, that's what we're talking about right here. And I ask you a simple question. Have you always been mindful of his unfailing love? I can have to say to you, there are times when, when life just has offered so much, I begin to, to lose the sense of value for God's love for me and for my unfailing love of him. That, that is what we need in today's world. I'm not asking you for your political perspective, but what happened one week ago, wasn't it last night, when a, a presidential candidate, when you look at the pictures and it shows the perspective and the spectrum to which the trajectory for which the bullet was to hit right in the temple, and just a matter of a head turn at the right time, and it only hits the ear. Let, let me say to you, when you look at this, uh, I am mindful, always, Lord, of your unfailing love. I don't care how smart or dumb or politically apt or inapt we are. Anybody would have to say, God stepped in. I wonder in your life when you really stop and let him test you and, and try you and examine you, you will begin to realize, God, you have stepped into my life many times right when I needed you most. That's when his glory really shines, isn't it? When I'm needing it the worst and his glory steps in. And then we have the great sacrifice to God. Psalm 51, verse 16 and 17 in the first translation you do not desire a sacrifice, or I would offer one. You do not want a burnt offering. The sacrifice you desire is a broken spirit. You will not reject a broken and repentant heart, O oh God. I think when we can realize that it's not about what all I can do for God, but it's that broken spirit to say, God, I've asked you to test you, and I've asked you to try me, and I've asked you to examine me, and you've brought out some of the flaws and the weaknesses I have, uh, but Lord God, you still want from me that heart and that spirit that's repentant, that's turned to you. In the wedding that I was dealing with yesterday, I often think sometimes we overlook the responsibilities. I've had people tell me when they have a broken marriage, well, it was all her fault. It was all his fault. I, and I think, whoa, 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 whoa. The moment you say you didn't contribute to any of the problems in your marriage, you're lying. It may be a 1090 or a 595, but for me to say any problems, in, and Brenda and I don't have fights. I want you to know that. But we have some very, very significant dialogues. And when we're having those, uh, sometimes I, I said, when you think you're losing, you know, I'm losing this argument, we usually have one sugar candy one back there that it's usually a winner. We can go grab that one and bring it back, and boy, I won this argument. Let me tell you just, a, that has nothing to do with this. But when you think you won an argument in your marriage, everybody's a loser. Because every time that happens, a little bit of the relationship is gone. I made a statement yesterday that I'd say to all of us right here. You tell me the truth all of the time. I can trust you all the time. But you lie to me one time, and I'll never know again when I can trust you. Isn't that a profound statement? I wish it could have been original with me, but it was not. Tell me the truth all the time. I think that's where we're at with God. You know, God already knows it. Isn't it amazing? Well, why can't we just go ahead and tell him the truth? He already knows it. But when we try to hedge it one time, sacrifice of the broken spirit, that is what God wants. And then what about the great decisions of the day? In Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 29, do not let anyone, any unwholesome talk, come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to
to their needs that it may benefit those who listen. There are so many significant little statements there. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. That's enough in itself. Uh, I, I don't know. I think you may have heard me say before. I Praise God, I don't have a problem swearing. Because if I did, who knows, Saddam Hussein would look like a Sunday school teacher. But I don't have a problem swearing. But even a couple of times, once at least this week, I said, if I did swear, right now would be a time to cut her loose. Just let it all go right now. I uh, worked with a young man years ago in Pipeline. We were unloading pipe with uh, uh, calipers. You had these little hooks that went to the end of the pipe. Big caliper grabbed it in the middle, and, you know, and they drug it around. Well, Jody and I were, were putting caliper things in the end, and there was this young guy in the middle that had the big clamp caliber, uh, caliper. And he was about 19, and it, when he would misjudge it, when it was swinging back in, and it would hit him or bang him on the knee, he would literally back up and bark at that caliper just like a dog will at a gopher hole. And, and it, he did it so many times that it got to where when the caliper hit him and he started the language, my brain was one word ahead of him. Now, in that, I thought, no way. But I had heard that so many times that my brain was trying to kick out. Let no unwholesome talk come out of it. It doesn't even mean you have to be swearing. Just unhealthy and wholesome. But only what is helpful for building others up. Wouldn't that be a great resolve to walk out here with today? God, this next seven days, I don't want to say anything that won't help to build up the people that I'm with. We live in a world right now where everybody around us needs a word of building up, a word of encouragement, according to their needs. Now that requires, first of all, that you have to get to know people enough and ask God to help you read the environment that you're in, to know what their need is. You know, some, we don't all need the same thing every day. Sometimes uh, my little granddaughter, great-granddaughter, needs a stern word. She needs to correct it. There are other times when she needs a little, you know, she came to me this morning, and I noticed she had this little tiny scratch on her lip. I mean, boy, that thing, is, it's big. It's just, you can barely see it with a magnifying glass. But her lip, you know, I've got a lip. She didn't need any rebuke in her. Say, oh, wow, you've got a hurt. Then she sees the hurt on my arm. And then she goes out there, oh, I've got a hurt just like my father. Learn where people are at and speak to their needs. And then he says that it may benefit those who listen. In Luke chapter 16, 45, it says, what you say flows from your heart. I was riding a bus one time from Prince George to Dawson Creek. Uh, and I'm sitting in the, the seat right here by the aisle, and there's a man beside me. And, and so I'm sharing Christ with him in the middle of the night. It was between midnight and 5 o'clock in the morning. So I'm sharing Christ with him to the best of my ability. When all of a sudden I realized when I looked forward and kind of looked over this way once, it was on the other side of the aisle and one seat back right there. That's the person that I was talking to, not the one beside me. God had me speaking to someone that would benefit the one who was listening and it was here. Uh, we got in a discussion, I did somewhere this last week. Uh, you know, there's some people you just can't get along with. Have you ever noticed that? And you think, why is that? Well, the scripture says, to as much as life within you to live possibly with all men. I like, if I had a whiteboard, I would draw you a line right here and say that you do everything you can with these arrows pointing toward that line. But there is a point at which you can't do anymore. You know what has to happen for it to go any further? You have to have a line or two come in from the other side. The other folks have to respond to that. Then this is what he's talking about. You try to find out who is listening to me because you can talk yourself to death and do nothing but make people mad if they're not interested in listening. And there are some people who are not going to listen to you and they're not going to listen to me. In fact, they just seem to be real happy living in the world of misery and anger 
You, you can't make them happy. So this is for that it may benefit those who listen, and it comes from the heart. In Psalm 62 and verse 8, a second major area of big decision. Trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your hearts to him, for God is our refuge. There are three major decisions right there that every one of us are faced with making today. Number one, to trust God at all times. And that's what he said, not me. He said, trust in him at all times, you people. For me, life fluctuates enough. There are sometimes it is extremely easy to trust God. You know, everything seems to be running along pretty smoothly. Uh, you don't have anybody really on your case. And then, boy, there are some times it seems like every time, every time I touch something, that something goes wrong. And you think, well, surely it can't be anything else. And about that time, something else goes wrong. And then something else goes wrong. And it keeps piling in. But here he says that I have a decision. Am I going to commit and vow today that, Lord God, I'm going to trust you at all times. I may not like what he's doing. I may not enjoy it at all. But I'm going to trust you, Lord, that ultimately you have eternity's best interest for me. And I think we need to begin to look for in perspective more that way. Don't look at this week or this month or this year. Oh, yeah, they say good goal setting is for this year, for five years, for 10 years, for 20 years. I don't almost think you're nuts if you're making goals for 20 years nowadays because I'm really hoping and believing that Jesus is going to return. But it, that's not my decision. That happens to be fully his. The second major decision there is to be willing to pour out your heart to God. That's more than my friend used to pray when we got ready to eat. Uh, through the teeth, over the tongue, look out gum, stomach, here I come. Amen, let's eat. This is when you say, life has now offered me more than I can handle. I, I cannot possibly bear up under what's happening. So then I pour out my heart to him. I make a personal recommendation to you. Don't wait till you get to that level. There is great joy in pouring out your heart to the Lord God and letting him pour into you and back into me. And then the third part of that major decision is, to acknowledge that God is my refuge. Where do you go when all the wheels are turning off and falling off? Where do you go? He says, I'm going to rush to the refuge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Part of the reason I would do that is because I believe he's capable of looking after me. Not only is he capable, I believe he's proven he's faithful. I believe he's, uh, he's knowledgeable. He knows when I'm needing refuge the most. Have you ever noticed a lot of times a little child, when they get hurt or something, they run to somebody and they want a hug. They want you to hold them. You're the refuge for that moment. And it may just take a few seconds and boy, they're off and gone to reckless little lifestyle again. And that's kind of like we are. We say, Lord God, you are my refuge all the time. And then we get finished with there. We go back into our reckless lifestyle until we need him, and then we rush back into his refuge. I would say this verse that I just read there in Psalm 62, Trust in him at all times. You people, pour out your hearts to him, for God is our refuge. I believe that verse can only happen when I have invited Jesus Christ to forgive my sins and become the Lord of my life. You've heard me say, and I repeat again and again, it is very possible. Get just enough religion to be miserable when we don't go deep enough in the Lord Jesus Christ. So my question to you is, is my heart, is your heart one that God can best use? Search me, O oh God, and know my heart today. Try me, O oh Savior, know my thoughts, I pray. See if there be some wicked way in me. Cleanse me from
from every sin and set me free. Listen, I think this would fit uh, Paul's words there in that last verse. Lord, take my life and make it wholly thine. Fill my poor heart with thy great love divine. Take all my will, my passion, self, and pride. I now surrender, Lord, in me abide. I ask you to join me. Let that be your heart song as you go out today. God, search me, test me, try me, examine me, and then give me the courage to bring it to you for proper adjustment. Lord, as we bow before you and as the worship team gets ready to come and lead us, God, we, we are your people. We get sometimes feel drained just because of the heat. But nothing refreshes us and renews us more than when you speak to us through song, through the printed word, through prayer together, and just by the fellowship of seeing each other again. Lord, direct and guide us this week. Be with this young lady who will be the cook at camp with every worker there, every child that attends. May they walk away on Friday evening or whenever they're finished and say, this has been a great week to be with others in God's presence. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Worship team, you come and lead.